I give you in response, Dr. David Chet. There is one word that especially comes to mind when I, when I hear uh, Simon's presentation here, and that is uh, the word brilliant. Uh, this is an absolutely brilliant presentation, and I mean that, Simon, in both the British and the American sense of the word. Um, and, and what you need to know, uh, for, again, is that the gentleman that you just had present, Dr. Gattacol, has has not only given you a nice overview and summary and spoken at a level that we can all, I think, understand, but he is also building on years of experience of detailed work in these Gospels. You may have noticed that um, when, when Mark at the very beginning showed you some of the books that Simon has written, uh, that one of them is on the Gospel of Judas, which he described in some detail. And it's, it is the best entry point, I think, into the Gospel of Judas. Uh, he presents the text, he translates it, he gives you a commentary on passage by passage all the way through. So if you want to get a sense for, your, for yourself what one of these uh, non-canonical apocryphal gospels feels like, then, then that is a great entry point into that. And then his, his work on Thomas, the monograph that's out, and the commentary that's coming. You, you have somebody who has a great deal of experience, and what he was doing was sharing to you in an approachable way kind of the, the, the results of years of careful study. So bear that in mind as you, as you see this, this brilliant presentation and a very helpful summary. There's so many features that I appreciated as I was uh, listening to the lecture. Um, you know, one of the things that he does is he does a great job of pointing out the late date of these Gospels. I love that illustration, don't you, of World War I and World War II and, and how, how distant some of these Gospels are from the actual events. Um, I also like um, the, the way that he shows to us that they don't really have the ring of historical plausibility uh, with the names and the issue of the coins as well as just the way that they don't feel at all like second century or first century Judaism. They feel like second century Gnosticism. Um, I think one of the things that Simon very wisely does in this presentation as well is to give us a sense of the contents of the gospel. Many of these, these gospels, um, many times when I've heard presentations on it, there's some excellent discussion of uh, the dates of the Gospels and, and the, the difference in dates. But I think one of the things that most helps us with it is, is when you give a people a sense of the contents of the Gospels, the allure of the Gospels is quickly diminished. I, I mean, by giving us a sense of the flavor of the Gospels, you, you have a sense uh, just how strange these are theologically, historically strange. And of course, his five evaluation points there, um, very careful and, and accurate critique. Um, one of the things that I, I like to say to my students is that as a New Testament scholar, um, Dr. Gattacol and myself and all in our field, kind of, we, we walk two lines. We're, we're historians as well as theologians. And, and you got a sense of, of, of Simon's theological heart, but you also have a very careful historical critique of what actually could go back to the time of Jesus. With these Gospels, there's something extremely helpful to them, of, of, or from them, to somebody in my position, in that they give us a great historical sense of second century Gnosticism. And that's, that's extremely useful. It is only if you then try and make a claim as to the historical Jesus that it becomes extremely problematic, as, as Simon has aptly said. Um, the one thing that I know Simon didn't have time for, he and I had a chance to discuss this beforehand, he simply didn't have time in the presentation to add to the presentation, um, and I mean, you know, there just physically wasn't time in, in the allotted time, to talk about the, the early church fathers and their testimony to the four canonical Gospels, and also their awareness of these non-canonical Gospels. Many of these non-canonical Gospels are actually discussed by church fathers in the second and third century. They know these Gospels. These, these are not a surprise. If you and I were living in the second century, and we were walking with people like Irenaeus and, and great scholars like that from that time, they had known, they, they knew the contents of these Gospels, and they were not surprised. They also knew how distant they were from the canonical Gospels. Um, aside from that, those same scholars uh, from that period, the second century, 
they also knew the four canonical Gospels, Matthew, Mark, Luke, John, the Gospels you and I know. And they frequently referred to them as the four. It was a collective whole. And that you see this at the end of the second century with somebody like Irenaeus. You see it with somebody like Tatian, who's going to pre present a harmony of the Gospels, but it's going to be called the Dia Tesseron through the four Gospels. He takes the four Gospels because he knows those to be authentic in order to present his harmony in a single narrative. You see this with the Muratorian canon from roughly the same time that lists the four canonical Gospels as canon, and, and the other Gospels it explicitly excludes. You, you see this with even earlier as you move into the, the middle part of the second century with somebody like Justin in terms of the Gospels that he used. If you move into the beginning of the, of the second century, now we're just, we're, we're back to that time period that's, um, that, that's much like uh, almost World War I for us. Um, these authors from that time, like Papias, know that there are four canonical Gospels that are read in the churches and that are accepted. So, so that's very important ancillary testimony to the kinds of things that uh, Dr. Gattercole was presenting. Uh, now, uh, one of the things I, I did want to turn to just for a second, and, and uh, uh, Simon gave us, again, that wonderful illustration of World War I and World War II, right, with the idea that we are um, about as far away from World War II as the, the latest gospel in the New Testament was from the time of Jesus. We are about as far away from World War I, and this is, this is where I, I would uh, tweak what he said just slightly, as the earliest of the, uh, of the four Gospels they, did, they talked about uh, was away from Jesus. So the Gospel of Thomas is the earliest of the four Gospels he discussed. If, if we were to look at the other three Gospels, Judas, um, Philip, as well as um, uh, Thank you very much. That's right, exactly. Um, so it, 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 as the Gospel of Mary, those Gospels are actually about as time distant as we are from the Civil War. So think in those terms, okay? And that, as I was thinking about that just in the last couple of days, I, I came up with another analogy, which is uh, you, you may know that this summer that there was a, a, a great study of the Civil War period that also was a blockbuster movie. I'm, I'm of course, referring to... Abraham Lincoln, Vampire Hunter. <laughs> now, I have not actually seen Abraham Lincoln, Vampire Hunter. It just occurred to me in the last couple of days to think about that. Um, and so, as being, a, being a scholar, I knew exactly what to do. I poured myself a cup of coffee, and I went to Wikipedia. <laughs> <laughs> and I read about Abraham Lincoln, Vampire Hunter. What's it called? And, and, um, and, and what, of course, what Abraham Lincoln Vampire Hunter says is that basically almost every event in, in, Abraham, in Abraham Lincoln's life was actually the result of vampires, the death of his mother and many other events in his life, and that he fought vampires all the way through his, uh, his early days and into his presidency. Now, okay, remember that we're about that far out, and, and now somebody can create a narrative that is like that. And yet we're still in a position to be able to say, like Irenaeus was with the canonical gospels, uh, that's just kind of ridiculous. <laughs> that, that, that doesn't have any air of historical plausibility there. Now, I, I want to carry it a little bit further, that analogy, because I, I haven't yet kicked it around until it's completely dead. Um, <laughs> And so imagine with me, if, if you were to think of, again, Abraham Lincoln, Vampire Hunter, but you were also to think of somebody, let's, let's say Mark was, in addition to having constructed and uh, designed and, and built on his own at this beautiful library here, among many other things, he, he has another talent that you haven't heard about, which is that he's been working on a time machine in his basement. And, and, and he dials that time machine to about 1850 years later which is about how far we are from these non-canonical Gospels, Mary, Philip, etc. And, and he was to, to project himself into the future and, and to land back here in Houston. Houston at this time has, the suburbs have grown to encompass all of uh, southern Texas. 
um, eight, ten, hundred, fifty years in the future. The library is still standing, and um, they've almost been able to fill up after a uh, thousand years of, of careful acquisition all the shelf space <laughs> that Mark has already created. And 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 he was to go around, and he was to find that there are um, scholars in the day that are have been studying meticulously Abraham Lincoln Vampire Hunter. And, and some who have even been willing to leave the impression that we should take it quite seriously as a historical document, not just as a testimony to the, uh, the little cabal that created it, but it's something even broader. And, and that it actually represented the diversity of opinions about Abraham in, uh, in, in uh, Abraham Lincoln, that is, in uh, 21st century America. I think he would be a little bit disconcerted by that. If, if he were to read a work of fiction, let's call it the, um, I don't know, the Abraham Code, uh, <laughs> 1850 years in the future, and it was to say uh, something like uh, the Abraham Lincoln Vampire Hunter novel and movie actually is better history than any other previous historical work on Abraham Lincoln. I think the word he would use, and I, I recognize that this is a very non-scholarly word, but is that this is ludicrous. And I, I am going to say, I, I'm normally a very staid scholarly guy, and that is not a word that I use lightly. But let's return for just a half a second to these canonical gospels. Again, they give us great historical testimony to second century Gnosticism, and they're incredibly useful there. But if you are thinking of them in terms of historical plausibility to, to give us an accurate picture of who Jesus was, um, the word ludicrous simply has to come to mind. It is um, ludicrous to think that Jesus descended from the eons of Barbalo. It is, it is ludicrous to think that Jesus walked on this earth and taught others that their bodies didn't matter and that they were spiritually to ascend. It is ludicrous to think that he held that the Father that created the world that is around us was an evil God. It is, it is ludicrous to think that uh, he turned to Judas and, and praised him from releasing him from his earthly tent. That is, that is ludicrous in terms of actual history. And, and I think it's important for us to be able to see that, say that. What is not ludicrous, speaking as a historian of the New Testament era, and also as a theologian, is it is not ludicrous to say, along with the four canonical gospels, that Jesus was born in Bethlehem, that he walked and ministered in northern Galilee, that he taught of the kingdom of heaven, that he performed miraculous acts that other people perceived and, and they were amazed by. It's not ludicrous, and I, I'm working here with um, a very careful historical evaluation that's not just based on the four canonical gospels, but it is, that it is not ludicrous. In fact, it is right and good historically to say that Jesus faced a cross. It is, it is right historically to say that prior to that cross, he anticipated his death and he taught that it would be a ransom for sins. It is, it is not ludicrous to say that he instituted the Lord's Supper as a commemoration of his death that was the establishment of a covenant, and that his blood was the blood of a covenant that provides for forgiveness of sins. It is not ludicrous to say, historically even, that those, and I, here I go back to Peter Williams' presentation just, just recently, which is online. It is not ludicrous to say, historically, that the disciples of Jesus so believed that he was risen from the dead, that the tomb was empty, and that they had witnessed him personally, even touched him, that they were willing to die for that. That is not ludicrous. And so it, it's important to, to, to evaluate this on that level. Now, I, I should say at this stage that as you're filling out your cards um, to ask questions of Simon, it's important to distinguish the response from, this, from the, the lecture. And so Simon took the high road and spoke of World War II and World War I. It was I that mentioned Abraham Lincoln. <laughs> <the Empire. laughs> so be careful about that. But I do want to thank you all very much for, for this and Mark for presiding. <laughs> providing this. I have only two brief things to say. Uh, uh, both of these gentlemen are very generous in the way they do the dates. They did dates taking the latest written gospel and going backwards. 
And they did dates taking the earliest apocryphal gospel and going backwards. I'm a lawyer. I'm not so generous. <laughs> <laughs> Let's go to the Gospel of Mark. The Gospel of Mark was written at a time where from today, the President of the United States was either, depending on where you want to date it, Bill Clinton or Ron Reagan. That's how close the writing the Gospel of Mark was to the events of Jesus and his death. Now, I suspect a good many of you remember Bill Clinton and Ron Reagan uh, and probably voted for one or the other. <laughs> <laughs> Let's take the Gospel of Judas, which the, was it the National Enquirer or the Mail said had changed, the, would, <laughs> would destroy the church. If we go back in time, do you know who the President of the United States was when the Gospel of Judas was written? If it were written today? Well, we didn't have a president. It would have been 1742. We didn't even have a Boston Tea Party yet. So that's the difference in dating between the time that those Gospels were written versus the time of the events. My second comment. Uh, these guys are scholars, and as such, they have terms that they throw around that a lot of people may not uh, readily understand. At least, I've got two daughters in here, one who is almost 15 and one who is 13, and I suspect they don't understand what the Gnostics were and, so, uh, and the way this affected uh, or the way these apocryphal Gospels illuminate us about second century Gnosticism. So I want to take just a moment, and part of my response to make sure we understand this, you know, the church initially is, a, is a, a, a sect of Judaism. The initial wave of the church are Jews. Paul takes, well, first Peter with Cornelius, but, but Paul principally goes out into the Mediterranean world and he takes the gospel message, not simply to Jews, but to also Gentiles. Most of the Gentiles he goes to are Gentiles that are attending synagogue. So they're Gentiles that are at least tied into Judaism. Not all of them. He preaches on Mars Hill. But you've got that principally. Over time, however, throughout the world, History shows us that lesser and lesser of the intelligentsia within the church came out of Judaism and more and more came out of the Greek world and Greek thought. Several hundred years, 300 plus before Christ, there was a Greek philosopher named Plato who was one of the principal proponents of the idea that the soul is, is a, 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 a a pre-existent and eternal part of uh, an essence of a human and that right now it's chained within a body and the idea of a soul being severed from the body was a very platonic idea that took hold and and grew and permeated a lot of Greek philosophical thought so in the first century and even more so in the second century, the church was influenced as the Greek intelligentsia were entering into the church. They took these ideas of the soul and they would take New Testament gospels and other things which talked about soul or talked about life and they infused into a kind of a, a, a mishmash, a mashup of Christian doctrine, sort of, Christian words with this idea of, of, uh, uh, of a almost platonic dualism in man. And, and from this grew up a whole religious movement that's called Gnostics from the Greek word for knowledge because the idea was you could have secret knowledge that would help you understand these secrets and, and these are not secrets that are based upon the idea of, of man as a, a, an entire being made by God. They're based upon the idea that you've got this soul imprisoned in the body. 
And so they affected views of Christ. Some people thought that Jesus was just some soul that descended perhaps at the baptism onto this, or that Christ was a soul that descended at baptism onto this body of this fellow named Jesus. And in fact, one famous Gnostic taught that right toward the end, not wanting to endure the crucifixion, Christ left Jesus, let Jesus die, and he, Christ watched it from another hillside. Because, you know, and, and there are different views of how this came down, lots of different views. Those are the Gnostic views that we see reflected in these Gospels to some degree or another. And that's the sense that David and Simon, I think, would agree. Would uh, uh, these Gospels help teach us more about what the Gnostics thought? 